Bonjour et bienvenue. Je suis Alexandre Badzak, directrice de la Galerie d'Art Ottawa. Hello and welcome everyone to our virtual conversation exploring anti-Black racism, actions to consider moving forward, and how the arts and arts institutions like the Ottawa Art Gallery are implicated. My name is Alexander Badzak and I'm the director and CEO of the Ottawa Art Gallery. Before introductions, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the Ottawa Art, that the Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the beautiful Anishinaabe Aki territory. The Anishinaabe have been on this vast territory known today as the city of Ottawa since the beginning of time. All sorts of art forms have been and continue to be a part of the vibrant Anishinaabe culture. Je salue la nation Anishinaabe, car nous nous trouvons aujourd'hui sur ces terres non cédées qui fournissent à le futur de nombreuses sources d'inspiration. As some of you know, the Ottawa Art Gallery is in the process of renewing its strategic priorities, those high-level statements that allow me as director and staff to guide the gallery's focus and resources over the next few years. The last five years were really dominated by building the OEG and ensuring its sound operations. And now the board of directors and staff really want to cast our minds fairly far into the future so that we aren't just planning for the next five years, but in fact creating the building blocks for the future. It just so happened the City of Ottawa was also working on its master plan and took 2036 as its end point to explore various scenarios of what our city might look like. And it's going to look quite different. Uh, so we followed suit and we created the series OEG 2036 uh, which is seen as bringing keynote speakers, conduct focus group sessions with a myriad of thought leaders and community groups. We had sent out invitations in March for a focus group session with artists from the Black communities, uh, and then COVID hit, uh, so we had to cancel. But in light of the traumatic events that have impacted our entire globe, and especially here in Ottawa, we felt the need to use this platform to start a conversation. But this is truly only the beginning. What we hope is that we can generate thoughts and ideas, air concerns and issues, and use this to direct next steps and further conversations and actions. Whether it be small group discussions on more distilled topics, facilitating connections between various organizations, or the creation of exhibitions, community events and programs, this is by no means a one and done, rather the beginning of something to build on. Uh, we have some initiatives in the work, but we still uh, obviously want to hear from all of you as to how we might collectively and collaboratively move forward. En nom de la Galerie d'Art Ottawa, je vous remercie, nous en venti. Uh, Aujourd'hui, maintenant, il me fait plaisir de vous présenter notre moderateur. I wish to thank the uh, participants in today's discussion. It is certainly my great pleasure to introduce and profusely thank uh, the moderator, the mod of today's conversation, an individual who, uh, while wearing her facilitator hat, helped to guide the OEG in its strategic plan leading up to our inaugural opening. He's an artist, he's a facilitator, and an OEG board member, Dominique Denere. Dominique. Merci, merci Alex. Alors, j'aimerais souhaiter la bienvenue à tout le monde. Alors, je sais qu'on est presque 400 personnes en ligne, et ensuite nous avons les, les panélistes qui sont là avec nous aujourd'hui. So I will be uh, introducing the panelists in just a minute, just wanting to, to say that this is a conversation that uh, is very uh, dear to my heart, uh, a focus on exploring anti-Black racism and uh, looking at what art institutions uh, can, can do differently, rethink uh, and re, re, uh, reorient, if you like. So uh, we're centering this uh, discussion on our Black experiences and uh, using a black lens to look at uh, all of these uh, uh, topics and how they impact us uh, as they relate to arts and culture. So uh, please make sure that you uh, put your questions and answers in the chat. Uh, we, will see, uh, we will see them and respond to them at the end of this conversation. Vous pouvez le faire dans l'une ou l'autre des langues officielles. Ce sera un plaisir de vous aider uh, uh, à, à les traduire au besoin pour certains de nos panélistes. Et on, on va répondre au plus de, de questions possibles dans ce contexte-ci. So starting with uh, Kosi, I, I've got the, I have the pleasure of uh, uh, having on the panel Kosi Nebe, a Nigerian-Canadian visual artist. 
And Kosi is an economist by training. So there's many ways to get to art. <laughs> uh, and a policy analyst by profession, visual arts practice is to engage viewers on issues, both personal and structural, in ways that bring awareness to their own complicity. Uh, many, many exhibitions, Aix Neo uh, Set, uh, the Muse Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, Place des Arts, uh, Art Gallery, uh, different parts of Canada, Studio 66 here in Ottawa, um, and even in California. So uh, you've also given presentations uh, on artistic practice and research, and you were also in many universities, including uh, McGill, uh, Laval, uh, and at uh, galleries, including ours, where you were part of the um, of, uh, of a discussion during the strategic planning, the first part of the strategic planning process. So welcome, uh, Kosi. Uh, our next uh, presenter, or not presenter, but panelist, is uh, Evelyn Dubery, and uh, Canadian flamework uh, glass artist, uh, adapting ancient hot glass sculpting and decorative techniques to express contemporary identities and ideas. She's also by day a career, uh, has a career in project and change management and works on uh, volunteer community uh, initiatives related to anti-racism, disability advocacy, LGBTQ2 um, uh, plus uh, uh, migration policy and empowerment of racialized people. So welcome Evelyn Dubern. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have with us uh, our uh, the counselor for the for, uh, Rideau, Rideau Ward. Okay. Uh, so Ralston King, you were the first ever Black City counselor. I've been in this town since the 60s, and this is a long time coming. Thank you. Uh, in a by-election in April 2019, Rideau, Rideau Rockcliffe Ward, uh, very varied ward uh, in terms of a spectrum, whether racialization or or, or class or, or, or wealth um, advance. Uh, your role now is to uh, really uh, uh, advance uh, anti-racism and race relations initiatives. It's one of your many hats that you wear and it's a recent appointment and the, uh, the actual title is Liaison for Anti-Racism and Ethno-Cultural Relations Initiatives. So you have been the, uh, very involved in the local visual and performative arts uh, um, president of Gallery 101, uh, an artist-run center. Uh, you were there for six years. Um, and then you were also very involved in different community associations, the Ottawa Police Service Community Equity Council, and uh, ha have won a, a medal from United Way on uh, community building. So welcome, please, to, uh, to our conversation. Uh, so, I'll start with Kosi. So we'll start uh, with questions for each of the panelists and invite others to, to, to chime in. Uh, we, um, we want to uh, leave as much time as possible for interaction with the, with the, the, the close to 400 people. It's still kind of wow. It's the biggest event uh, that we've ever had online, that the OAG has ever had online. And uh, uh, so uh, the first question was really, um, Kosi, in Ottawa, the Ottawa Citizen is something that uh, many of us read, and there was a wonderful article on you this weekend uh, about your art practice and some of the concepts that you use there um, were, were very interesting in terms of centering the Black experience and the hyper-visibility versus invisibility of Black artists, but I wanted you to, to use this, uh, this time to open the conversation on your experience in as, uh, as an artist and what you called uh, anti-blackness in the art world and share with us your knowledge today. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm really grateful to be part of this panel. Um, knowing that there are 400 people is quite nerve wracking, but also quite exciting. Um, so just even going, starting off with the Ottawa Citizen article, uh, it was amazing to say the least, um, to kind of like just see my dad barreling down the stairs being like, everyone's saying that you're on the front page of the Ottawa Citizen and going to buy the, the newspaper and seeing exactly that. And for me, that actually is quite symbolic of that kind of hyper visibility and invisibility because there is a whole backstory to that. Um, so initially that, that article came out as a response to an infographic that was speaking to the invisibility or the lack of representation of black artists within Ottawa's commercial art galleries. And I learned about the media requests 
to um, these galleries, kind of asking them about the about why it is that there aren't any or not a lot of um, black artists represented within their rosters. And me being on the front page of the Ottawa Citizen was actually a result of me reaching out to the reporter and saying that only centering um, the experience or the words and perspectives of those commercial gallery owners is actually perpetuating that same anti-blackness by further rendering us invisible. So I had to actually go out of my way to advocate um, for our, our kind of like visibility within these discussions to advocate that our voices be centered. And that's how I ended up being on that front page and being hyper visible. But it was really as a result of that actual invisibility. So when I speak about that hyper invisibility and invisibility always operating at the same time, even that article is kind of symptomatic of that kind of reality. And I think it's important to kind of go back to when I first started as an artist in Montreal, when I was about 19 to um, 20, 22, I was in Montreal and kind of just starting to step into the art scene there. And my experience within Montreal's art scene was primarily just having shows around Black History Month. So mm -hmm. outside of February, it was very difficult to get any shows and to get your foot in the door. But come February, there are a lot of opportunities. And um, at some point, I was actually approached by a curator who was organizing an exhibition in March, I believe, or anyways, it wasn't in February. And it was highlighting women artists. And it was my first time being invited into a group exhibition like that. I was extremely excited, very emerging artists being showcased alongside more established artists. And it ended up being an absolutely terrible experience where the reality of me being an emerging black, young black artist that not a lot of people knew about meant that that curator uh, treated me with so little respect. And even as I was developing my proposal and developing my artwork, I was constantly being told, make it smaller, make it smaller. You don't want to take away from all the other artists. Essentially, make yourself smaller because you're not that important. And I did that. I made, uh, I changed everything about the work in order to fit that mold. Wow. And then I remember the opening night um, where the media was there, where everyone was there. I got to the, I got to the, um, the gallery and I saw my work in the middle of one of the, um, the back rooms. And that was totally fine. Um, the issue was that there was no label. So this was the opening night. This is where the media is. When the media is actually at the opening, um, seeing the exhibition, meeting the artists and so on. And my work has no name. My name is not attached to it. There isn't a title. And I went to go to the curator and I asked her about that. And she told me that, you know, I hadn't given her the title, that she had tried calling me the day before. And those were all lies. I had given her the title for that piece when I sent in the, the proposal initially. And there had been no phone calls. And when I asked her, what is it that I can do so that we can kind of rectify the situation, I was told to go to Dollarama to buy my own label and to write it myself. Um, and there, was, uh, there were people who actually worked at the gallery who were in the space at the time and overheard the conversation and came to see me afterwards and told me they could print out the label on the spot. And that was something that was never offered. Um, so they did that and they apologized profusely. And those are just the kinds of experiences that from the get-go has made me so unwilling uh, or so yeah unwilling to kind of let things slide so when i see that i'm going to again be marginalized that i'm going to again be silenced i speak up and that's what happened with ottawa citizen and that's what happens with any other experiences that i've had where i have encountered anti-blackness where i have encountered um experiences that have meant have intended to belittle me and make me feel like i didn't uh, i don't belong i have had to stand up and I think it's something that I find quite unfortunate that oftentimes when we're given um, the space to speak to our experiences, it's always in the context of Black pain and Black suffering and Black silencing. And we're often not given the space to celebrate our achievements. I had an exhibition that I curated, my first time curating an exhibition in February. I would have wanted the Ottawa Citizen to highlight that. I would have wanted the Ottawa Citizen to celebrate that with me. Right. And instead, what's happening is that we're we're only giving these spaces. And I'm, again, I'm very grateful to be here right now. But the, the fact that there are 400 people on here, I think it is because of this moment. And yeah. I don't know if this would have happened out, um, otherwise. I don't know if I, if I were invited to give an artist talk, that there would have been the same reception. So I want to know when I want there to be that same level of interest when it comes to celebrating Black life. Right. And that doesn't always happen.
Right. So thank you very much for opening the, the conversation that way. So you're talking about not just being there in, in uh, when it suits the institutions or the broader audience. So Black History Month or other elements of that or everything that's happening right now, but being put in the center and given space and welcomed in the art space uh, at, at any time because of the talent and, and the contribution. So thank you very much for that. We'll come back. <laughs> not to worry. And if you see anything in the chats or the uh, that you want to uh, address, don't hesitate. Evelyn, uh, coming to you next because you're both an artist and a and a collector. And so uh, in our our chat uh, previous to this, uh, definitely um, it was it was clear that you're saying, well, I will tell us. I'd rather you use your words about your experience of walking into certain galleries and. Uh, uh, whether commercial galleries or public galleries and how you feel as a black artist and also a collector. Okay, so what I can tell you is that there's always this balance of positivity and negativity when both in, in my experiences, both as an artist um, who's uh, started trying to do exhibitions and to, and to build an art practice, and as well as a collector who's trying to collect work from all artists, but really I would specifically like to um, spend most of my funds supporting um, young black artists in their career. So from the collector perspective, I would say my experiences are, I would say about 60% positive, 40% negative, and depending on the city, that can go either way. So it can be more negative or more positive. What I find a lot of the times is when I walk into the gallery, I don't see um, art that I'm interested in buying. It's a lot of it's a lot of landscapes. It's a lot of uh, it's a lot of what I would consider safe art. It's not it's not an art that re that reflects the world that we're living in today. It's not a, it's not art that reflects what the, what the city of Ottawa has become. I've been living in Ottawa since 1996, so I've seen the city transform, and I see the vibrancy in the city now. I'm not seeing that reflected in the galleries, which is disappointing. When I'm looking for um, for artwork to purchase, what I've had to do is go on social media and find young artists there. I go to the smaller community events that uh, that the young folks are are. are are, are running for themselves and I'm buying art from them directly there, following them on Instagram, um, um, following them on their social media, reaching out to them, encouraging them. That's what, that's what I'm having to do in order to buy art. I shouldn't have to put in that much work to buy art. I should be able to just walk into my local galleries and be able to say, this one's great and buy whatever I like. That's that, and, and, has, and see the full range of artis artistic expression from this city. Right, okay. And so what would it look like just uh... What would you what would you want to see? Are there particular areas where you're saying the gaps are the biggest? Yes, the, I would say that there's a lot of there there for what we consider the mainstream expression. There's there's enough of it out there, um, and I find there tends to be a sameness to it. So if you go from one gallery to the next, would I be able to say, well, that one has a particular theme versus the other one? It's 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 a lot of it's a lot of the same. Right. Even when I go to the United States versus Canada, it's it's a lot of the same themes. What I, and then when you do see something that's uh, so non-Euro-centered, a lot of the times it's filtered through a Eurocentric lens. So it's not an artist of color. It's not a black or indigenous or person mm -hmm. of color artist's mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. It's someone who's not from that community who went on a, at a trip and then filtered their vision through that or was inspired and then filtered their vision through that. And that's what's being offered to me when I see a brown face on a wall, which, I, which is not what I'm looking for. I'm right. looking for something more authentic than that. Right, and encouraging the young up and coming artists. And so you see that as a role then for galleries and- um, Absolutely. Okay. okay. It's, yes. it's, 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 tax, it's, it's our tax dollars as well. So if, uh, and especially with the, with the prevalence of social media, if the galleries are not going to be um, presenting and, and supporting their, their actual community members, then we would ask the question is why are our tax dollars being spent to support that gallery? Right, thank you. And we just saw a comment saying, uh, where can we find black art? And that's the, a very telling exactly comment. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it's, not, it's not easy to find. In the and I can tell you right now, it's Instagram. Instagram is where I found artists to follow and, uh, and, uh, and, and purchase from. Okay. Um, so if I wanted to speak to my own experience, the negative would be higher in terms of joining artistic groups within the city and working closely with them within my mediums. I found that's been a lovely experience. 
um, the glass community in Canada is very small, but I'm part of the international community, international glass community, but they're fantastic people. In terms of the gallery experience, though, when, I've, when, uh, when I started to do exhibitions um, a few years ago, it was not good, right? So I have, do I, do I have time for a story or should I? Or should uh, I uh, um, give, me, give the story very fast, but because we want to speak about real experiences. Yeah. And by the way, you have a fan who likes the fact that your headphones are matching your, your, uh, your sweater. That's all. That was just... <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so this, this, I, I have a similar experience to Kosi where I found there was a hyper interest in us during Black History Month, absolutely no interest in us outside of Black History Month. The experience I have is similar to hers where I had my pieces in the art gallery and I was treated again incredibly disrespectfully and again by the gallery director. Um, and I just brought this, and I brought this piece here just to show because that was the case. And I'm hoping that gallery director sees it and reaches out to me because I'm still um, quite disturbed at, at what happened at the, at the night of the Vernissage. Um, in terms of otherwise, it's again, there seem to be always gatekeepers who are there, who want to filter our voices, who want to tell us that our art is not as relevant as if I was not a person of uh, not a black person. There's someone who wants to tell us that our, that black art is not part of the Canadian fabric when black presence in Canada predates the creation of even Canada mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I find that a constantly frustrating battle where it's, 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 it's that othering that tells us that our story doesn't belong in the center of the Canadian experience, it belongs in the margins, when we already know that we are part of the founding peoples of Canada. Okay. okay, thank you very much for that. We'll come back to this Eurocentric lens if, and if there's something that uh, galleries can do about that right now <laughs> and uh, moving forward. So I'd like to, uh, to go next to uh, our councillor, uh, Rolf and King, and, and ask you to explain to us a little bit what your role is. Um, when, uh, when we talk about liaison for anti-racism and ethnocultural relationships in a nutshell, what does that mean for the city of Ottawa? That means that residents have a uh, voice around the council table, somebody that they can go to uh, who will be able to liaise directly with city staff on uh, some of the issues that we're discussing here, uh, because the uh, real issue uh, that addresses, uh, that really affects our community is equity, equity of opportunity, equity of outcomes. And I have to echo what I've just heard from uh, the wonderful uh, artists and collectors that we have on this panel. You know, the, the idea that uh, when you walk into a gallery, uh, especially if it is a publicly funded space, uh, you should have space there. And uh, we actually heard that when we did consultations uh, mm -hmm. to establish an anti-racism secretariat at the city. So as a liaison, I'll be a person who uh, residents will be able to contact um, and I'll be able to deal with uh, both the mayor's office and city staff who will be working at this anti-racism policy unit uh, that will be fighting systemic uh, racism and institutionalized racism at, at our city. Uh, you know, people should uh, not um, have to worry about getting access to uh, the services that they're entitled to around um, housing, around economic development, around uh, employment opportunities and employment equity at the city um, and feel that they are inhibited uh, from doing that because of the color of their skin or their culture or their ethnic origin or their religion. Um, that, that's unacceptable in Canada. A council actually um, ascertained and determined that and said, you know what, we need to have tools to ensure that uh, people have fair access to our institutions. And that includes our artistic and cultural institutions. Um, because um, if you are in an art show, you should feel valued. Um, especially if it's in a public institution. Um, if you are, are um, you know, engaged in uh, the process and in, in, our, in our arts and in our culture, um, you should feel that you're at the center, not at the margins. Um, and, and that's something we actually heard in consultations, specifically around arts and culture. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, so it's not just employment equity, governance, housing, economic development, uh, health outcomes, and youth development. It's also going to be about ensuring that we have equity in terms of access to 
arts and culture. Uh, the, the next question is, is really around what people are saying that they need, but also uh, for, as someone who's moderated a number of conferences over the last many decades uh, uh, with outcomes and action plans, it's, uh, there's, there's already a lot of information about what can be done. And I know that there's the sort of work that's being done with Herongate, for example, and telling that story and, and uh, uh, in, uh, in the Ottawa Art Gallery in particular, but you know, basically getting a sense of, uh, are you looking at all those other recommendations that have come up from various consultations over the decades about how mm -hmm. the black community wants to be and uh, the, the full uh, racialized community wants to be considered? Mm -hmm. We definitely will be. And I think that um, we'll be looking and listening to uh, people is that's very important. So I think that part and parcel of the um, anti-racism secretariat and its establishment will be engaging in a conversation, but it, it, but it is an enhanced a, a conversation, what I'd like to call radical um, um, consultation, because often uh, we're, we're consulted, but we don't actually see uh, engagement or, or, right. or, or, right. or policies after that. I think right. the goal should be conversations that lead to education of the wider community and then a radical engagement and 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 a deployment of, of policies mm -hmm. and this is very important and, and I think uh, we have seen uh, best practices in the city um, as you had mentioned I was the president of gallery 101 for several years and during my time there I saw an evolution in terms of the way that we engage uh, artists of course it's an artist run center so I think that uh, those often are more progressive in the in the way that they they undertake outreach but I mean we had shows uh, that dealt with um, and and this was on the basis of the of the great work of the curator Laura Margita who's still there at, uh, at G101 uh, but work that really engaged newcomer com uh, communities there was a show about uh, the uh, challenges around the immigration or the, the refugee crisis uh, uh, with Syria uh, there there was greater engagement with our indigenous with the indigenous community to ensure that there are opportunities uh, for for indigenous artists to show, and there were there were some uh, opportunities as well for for black artists. And I think that we have to look at those best practices, and we have to ensure that there are curatorial opportunities uh, for artists for 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 uh, black people in the city as well, um, so that they can uh, gain that experience and curate uh, black artists uh, in in these spaces. I think it, it's, it's important to, to ensure that we move people to the center and that they feel that they are of importance when they enter into uh, these institutions. Uh, I can speak of this a little bit because uh, my wife is, uh, is a prominent indigenous curator and I went to multiple shows at the National Gallery. And uh, if, you, if you think about uh, racism or systemic racism, you know, I come after work in my suit and I would be mistaken as a uh, security guard you know somebody would turn around and ask me questions and I, and I was wishing that they would be asking me questions about the art uh, because my wife as a curator uh, would be engaged in the art and I'd be engaged in the art as well mm -hmm. and I think that this is this is the key is ensuring that we create spaces together that we are actually part of those spaces that we are contributing intellectually and in terms of the leadership in those spaces and, and we're giving voice and we're moving past tokenism as well. Right. So we don't have people, we don't have people in these institutions simply to say that we have people in the institutions. Right. And, we, and we also give space to the curator so yeah. that we never see exhibitions like the Spirit Sings or Into the Heart of Africa ever again. We have people who are engaged in the art, telling the stories and curating those, those, those stories. So you know, that would be my vision. Okay, thank you for that. I can sense the passion <laughs> around, around that as well. So uh, we, I'd like to take the next few minutes to talk about the centering and to talk about artists and to talk about local artists and, uh, and what the OAGs and other galleries can also do to, to support not only the centering of, of the Black art, artist and his or her experience, but the, the community that you know, is right here right right next door right uh, one of the comments was saying tourists can come to ottawa and not even buy local art you know given what is present in the galleries or elsewhere so that's definitely uh something that we uh that we need to keep in mind so the last question before we go to the audience is uh 
and Kosi, someone wants to know more about your work. So that'll be uh, something for you to, to speak about if you're, if you're willing uh, when we come to, uh, to that piece of it. Um, so uh, with respect to, uh, to the OAG, so we've talked about the arts and culture in the city. We've talked about anti-racism a little bit. Uh, and uh, we've talked about avoiding tokenism so and also those words that brands are all coming up with uh, that say something but the reality is different we've talked about making that reality different through things like curating through expanding beyond black history Month to you know the the to uh the full space if you like uh, so give us a few um, uh, examples for the OAG because the board members are listening and other galleries are listening to um, regarding uh, what could be done differently in addition to what you've said whether it's collections exhibitions so we've got items in the collections at the OAG we have some exhibitions past and planned uh, some events and speakers, um, some uh, powerful ones, uh, uh, learning, community engagements, commercial space, but it's, you know, it's in its, it's starting and what else can be done to make this bolder and uh, uh, more centered. So I'll go back to Kosi because it's been a while since we've heard your voice and uh, uh, so give us some, some of your thoughts for this particular institution called uh, called uh, the Ottawa Art Gallery. Um, so yeah, yeah, I I have a lot of thoughts about institutions generally. Um, so I work uh, with the federal government, which could be labeled one of the biggest institutions. And I've been thinking through what that means to work within an institution and to try and advocate for radical change. And sometimes I do feel as though that feels like an oxymoron. Um, and I am someone who is increasingly critical um, at times of the ways in which um, change within institutions is quite incremental and um, isn't necessarily always looking towards that kind of transformative change, which actually calls into, the quest in, into question the way in which we actually conceive of institutions. Um, so I'm interested in the work of Sarah Ahmed, for example, who's a, um, an academic who really does pay a lot of attention to institutions and diversity with institutions within institutions and what she says is that the way we approach them right now is that's kind of like the status quo this fact um, this social fact when in fact institutions are about processes and I think in order to actually change and center or even like really bring in um, black communities we really have to think through what it means to be an institution and actually recreate or institutionalize new practice new practices so I think there needs to be a greater focus on the processes, on the relationships, on the policies and so on. And I think oh. there needs to be a radical kind of rethinking of what an institution is because you become an institution. It is an act, it is a practice. Every single day is a, an opportunity to change that. And I think right now, um, with the institutions as they are, with the kind of um, the ways in which they operate, what you would have is just a, to a kind of tokenization because we're not fundamentally rethinking what undergirds um, those kinds of, of, of spaces. And I think we really have to um, take a very broad based approach. And I don't know necessarily that there's going to be a blueprint for every single institution, but I really do think it has to look internally. So really starting to engage with um, the people who are within the institution itself. So the employees, uh, the staff, making sure that they have a voice, making sure that they feel as though they are being consulted in decision making. And I, I know from way too many people who work within art spaces, racialized folks, that they're they not heard and they leave. And I think that is because the institution was not meant for them. Um, and we have to recreate those institutions. We have to change everything about the practices. Uh, and we need to really start looking at leadership as well. So it's one thing to be a staff member, but we also have to change uh, the leadership. And right now there's so few black folks uh, within the senior ranks of, of leadership within these art institutions, be it the granting organizations or the community organizations or the galleries and museums and so on. I think fundamentally we have to make sure that there's a culture that supports them when they're at the staff level, but also promotes them into the ranks of leadership to be able to really mobilize for that change. And I think there needs to be efforts to actually decentralize. 
so that we're not looking to one institution to kind of like be the be all end all, but really starting to support other um, efforts that are happening outside of these spaces. Because again, these institutions as they are, are we're not meant to really for us to succeed within them, right? And that's why it becomes very easy to have discussions around the failure of these institutions because they were never we were never meant to succeed anyway. Mm. Um, so I want to also see how can we actually move away from these and actually start to look at other spaces and it could be collectives and they're already here so full fam is a wonderful example of a collective being led by black women and uh, gender non-conforming folks and who are really pushing this work i want to i want the resources to go there okay. i want the resources to go there as well to put the to put the money there to support efforts uh, collectives and uh, old back is another one ottawa black artists mm -hmm. collectives and others and uh, to make sure that uh, that it's it's not just tweaking but it's actually re rethinking uh you talked about uh, all of you about get not all of you but some of you about gatekeeping and you've talked about decentralization as well let's go to evelyn and ask for for your perspective thank you uh and starting from the inside wanted to also reinforce what you said kosi in terms of the the folks inside the system as well and giving them voice evelyn what would you um what would you add to uh to uh, to Kosi's points about what the OAG in particular uh, can do. Um, one of the things I, I would I would absolutely say is avoid. I I came up with the phrase unicorn floss um, over the last over the last couple months um, because what it is is when people was when we're seeing organizations and institutions come up with these broad statements about their support for the Black community and. Uh, and how they they understand Black Lives Matter. When we and then right after that, they're being edited by their own staff, in terms of how mis how, how much they do not value the Black experience and Black participation and Black contri contributions. So unicorn floss essentially means it's just it's it's a fantasy story that someone wrote up to make themselves feel better, as opposed to really taking a hard deep look inside their institution to say what is it that we're doing wrong. How do we change it and how do we go forward? And my focus is yes, there is these organizational processes that need to happen. But I also think right now, right in this moment, there needs to be immediate action to say, we are doing this right now to launch this process to go forward. Mm -hmm. We can have discussions about what action is going to be, but there has to be that willingness to say, we're not only putting resources toward it, we're putting money towards it and we're having someone in an executive level sponsoring this movement going forward and that's how we'll see some change. If we don't do that, there will never be a trust in, 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 in Ottawa Art Gallery or any of the or, arts organizations. These kinds of panel discussions have I've been I've participated in them for most of my adult life. I was dragged to them as a child. And it's it's the same it's churn. And so what we do is we come we, we tell everyone about our pain, we tell them about our struggles, we tell them about how we keep butting up against the gatekeepers of their, of their institutions. They feed us some uniform floss. There's a couple other discussions. Someone is paid handsomely, usually not from the black community, to write a wonderful report about it. And then it disappears again until it pops up again another five years. And so I'm hoping what happens with the, with the OAG this time is that we're not going to repeat that cycle. There are already a million reports out of how to make uh, how to more how to more fully integrate the black experience and black art and culture into our institutions let's just act let's pick act three well, things and act okay pick three things act listen to the voices listen to people speaking about this as opposed to uh, coming out with uh, the the fantasy story as you say absolutely that doesn't go anywhere after that so uh Ralston, you have the last couple of minutes before we go we've got uh, we'd love to keep 20 minutes for the exchange with the numerous people on the, online. So uh, couple, uh, some words from you about what the OAG and specifically could be considering. As a public gallery, as a, an art institution, there's many others. We're one among many, but tell us. Absolutely. Well, I have to concur with both uh, Kosi and, and Evelyn. I think that at the city level, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, we, uh, uh, and the community itself, uh, asked for an anti-racism secretariat was because uh, we've had a lot of words and you know their words are, uh, are very uh, prolific we have a tremendous number of reports now it's time for action now it's time for deeds and so uh, we need to have the uh, structures to do that 
and the anti-racism uh, policy unit at the city is going to be designed to uh, listen to people really quickly and to really uh, look at some radical uh, engagement and radical uh, change in terms of identifying real issues and uh, creating an action plan based off of community input and then enacting changes to policy. Okay. And uh, like I said, uh, people want to see changes to uh, cultural institutions. Uh, my feeling is that, uh, you know, uh, where uh, Kosi and, and Evelyn are absolutely correct is you can't just simply hire somebody and say, you know, we've achieved uh, diversity. You, we have to be really looking at uh, the internal processes, uh, changing uh, the way and transforming institutions uh, so that uh, they are truly accommodative, truly inclusive, and are and not are just simply uh, paying lip service to communities uh, for the sake of uh, a diversity policy. Mm -hmm. um, so sure, you're absolutely right. I think that this is a, this is a kind of inflection point. This is a moment in history where right. we can go either uh, one way or the other way. And I would rather go forward uh, rather than backwards with uh, you know simply kind of uh, diversity tokenism. Uh, I think it's important to to really have a, a more kind of collective view at these at these organizations, an inclusive view that gives wider space uh, to uh, wider voices, to to a larger number of voices, right. and uh, that model um, exists, I think, in, in a better way, in in a more in a with better best practices in some of the artist-run centers. Uh, across the city. Okay. So I think that, yeah. you know, we can, we can learn from the way that we engage with people from some of the models that already exist. Uh, but I think that it has to be meaningful uh, change. I mean, that's what I'm seeking in terms of my position. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. as, as most uh, Black people in the city know, uh, we can't waste time. I'm, I'm not in my position uh, to uh, simply, uh, you know, speak words and not see deeds. Uh, we that's actually so have to see change, real change. Yeah. And Let I think that that's, that's how uh, I think institutions need to position quickly. themselves. Thank you. Yes, yes. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going quickly because we do want to hear from, we have woven in some of the comments and questions that we've, we've had. So we're talking about real action and some people are asking us what actions. Give us a particular, give us some, some specifics about, about the actions that you want to see. So one of the questions, you know, for example, there's acquisitions in a permanent collection, there's commissions, there's, uh, there's exhibitions and, uh, and money, as uh, Kosi said, like bring the money to the organizations that don't have the power. You have power as a museum, help the ones who, who don't and, and flourish in their spaces as well. Uh, there's uh, probably other ways in which we could uh, the gallery could support as well and i i don't i say we but i mean it's really the, the gallery is 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 leading this and we're providing uh this advice so are there are you know maybe one one very very specific uh, for each of you from each of you to uh to respond to those questions that are coming in about what uh, we talk about three actions evelyn uh, just name one of those actions where it would make a different uh, a difference. You know, uh, art auction, consultations, community projects, speakers. Where? <laughs> I would say hire a curator from the Black community that does a good knowledge of the Black community and give them enough money to put on a show. Right now, we're in the middle of um, of a pandemic. We're in the middle of global protests about anti-Black racism and police brutality. The Black community around the world is traumatized. We have children, as I was on an educational panel this morning, where the principals uh, of Ontario were worrying about how they're gonna deal with the Black children returning to school in the fall and how we do it. All of us know that how we've been getting through this is through art. We've been getting jokes, we've been getting memes, People have put on comedy shows. Art has been helping us heal and recover through this. Here's an opportunity, the greatest, the most current, relevant opportunity to speak to the Black community. Tell us your story. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Kosi, one, one thing, and I know there's many, and this is only the first of many conversations, but what would be one thing that would visibly show support and, uh, and center our experiences? 
I definitely agree that like hiring a black curator and giving them the resources to be able to put together a show is definitely a great step. That is exactly what the Carleton University Art Gallery did with me in terms of me being an emerging artist. That was my first show. They helped me write the application for the grant. We worked together on that and they supported me throughout the entire process. I would like to see more of that. I would like to see these galleries actually proactively reaching out, um, knowing that there is this disparity within the art community in Ottawa and proactively reaching out to artists like myself, but so many others um, who are interested and are able to tell those stories. I'd also really like to see something similar with just artists and, and within artist run centers. Again, if we know that this is an issue, how can we proactively engage with artists? Again, another experience I had that was absolutely amazing, and I'm very grateful for all of these experiences, was with Axneal Set, where I was given the opportunity to have these two beautiful rooms within this amazing artist run center and told, basically, tell, tell us what you need and we'll give it to you. And they provided me with all the resources I needed. They provided me with the support and I was given the space to fail. You know, it ended up being a, a really great experience. And I, I don't think I feel that that show, but even if I had, I was given the opportunity to do what I wanted. Um, so I think, I think I there just to, needs to be yeah. more of that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, thank you for that. So those are pretty clear. So for those who said, tell us, tell us what exactly this is, this is wonderful. So, and even as you say, fail, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's important. Again. So um, a question here about art uh, festivals and events outside the gallery and how the OAG could support. Any thoughts, uh, Ralston, or the arts institutions generally were much beyond the OAG as well there. So any thoughts about how uh, art institutions could support art festivals and events that where we are center uh, center in the in the institution. yeah I think that we should uh, see uh, larger institutions doing more of that especially uh, from our indigenous communities and our racialized communities and uh, help provide resources uh, whether through sponsorships or whether through venues to really give uh, people space because that's ideally what our what our galleries and museums are they're spaces uh, for a cultural demonstration to really, uh, you know, uh, really relay messages. And I've seen that successfully done uh, with some uh, uh, Indigenous uh, art festivals. Uh, Asanapka comes to mind uh, in some of their partnerships with Saw Gallery. Once again, uh, you know, the artist run centers really being at the at the forefront. And, and that's, that's, uh, I think we need to see and seek out and help incubate uh, these these wonderful art festivals that emerge from uh, communities that typically have been at the margins and say we are going to bring them to the center um, and and allow them to have a full participation uh, more participation and and help provide some resources so I think that that's that's important I think that the, one of the keys for me is looking at uh, some of the artist run centers in our region as uh, as really demonstrating some of the best practices. Um, you know, I think of, of 101 and the idea of people coming together in, in, in a kind of a collective, in a circle, chatting, uh, whether it's artists, curators, um, an eclectic mix of people, and then ultimately ideas emerging about exhibitions or ways to utilize the space. I think if our larger or, uh, um, institutions did that, we would have a tremendously a, a larger amount of exciting programming that really emerges from community. So I'd like to see more of that. More of that, thank you. Um, one of the uh, commenters said sponsorship, mentorship, uh, supports in that way as well. Uh, people coming in on, on um, uh, in experiences where they can learn within the space as, as well, uh, giving artists opportunities to shine. There's many examples coming through the chat. I'd like to give the uh, voice uh, to one young man who uh, um, wanted to speak, uh, a muralist, uh, well known actually uh, uh, from the uh, from the community, uh, the, uh, a black artist, uh, and it's not because he's Haitian that I'm I'm choosing him. <laughs> it's uh, Obac, the uh, Ottawa Black Art Collective. Uh, um, they reached out and said, "Could we uh, could we speak?" So Alan. Uh, Alan Andre, uh, who has uh, won so many art battles and competitions and who is uh, very, uh, very active as, as a muralist as well. Uh, tell us about your, uh, quickly about your experience, any comment or question around 
this whole idea of uh, anti-blackness or anti-black racism and what our institutions can do about this. Alan? Hi, how are you guys doing? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you awesome. and you can see a lovely picture of you painting, but go ahead. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Okay. Uh, yeah, so my, uh, my experience uh, has been that um, Ottawa, I feel in general has had a, um, a big issue with celebrating and representing their artists uh, in a way where um, people that come to the city and people from other cities just don't know who we are and they don't know where to find us. So I think, uh, I think it's up to major institutions to, um, to really mine the talent that's here because there's so much talent oh, that I've yeah. seen and to put them at the forefront um, in order to uh, just kind of invest in our communities. And uh, I would say uh, throughout my experience as an artist in the city, um, moving throughout the city, you actually have to kind of always look at yourself through the lens of these institutions or look at yourself through the lens of uh, the people that you're dealing with in a way where you feel like it can often it can it, it can often kind of push you in a direction to create work that fits a certain narrative and um, i think one of the things that's important is for institutions to look for artists of color that might not always be speaking about issues of color so okay. um, yeah, I think it's important to realize that um, although we have a very unique Black experience, we also have a wide range of a human experience, and our work should be included in other in other areas. So, right. um, I had a piece called "The Colors We Think In," and it's very sarcastic because I painted it in black and white um, because I felt like I was forced to look at the world through a black and white lens. Um, I've been asked at different shows, why are you painting a black person or why are you painting a white person? You should be painting this, you should be painting that. And I think it's tough for a lot of artists because a lot of times your work is always being critiqued through a racial lens. And I think it is important for us to open, um, kind of just open our our uh, expectations of Black artists to a wider range. Um, that being said, as a Black artist, I do believe uh, it's important to show solidarity um, in my work through, like, through strength, through unity. So whenever something's going on around the world, I feel like I do have a personal responsibility to uh, create work um, that the community uh, to help heal the community or to help push um, those uh, push progress in terms of that. So I think a lot of black artists are burdened to uh, or feel the burden to have to create that. But I, I, I do have to illustrate that it is important for us to um, it is important for us to uh, stand in solidarity. So I always use the model like strength through unity and strength in numbers. So, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's, thank yeah. you. Very profound. Uh, and yes, uh, why limit us to being black artists only like in terms of what we represent, we are black, <laughs> but we can represent anything. And so not being boxed in and some of you talked about the lens and, and, uh, and how you're, how we're perceived. And uh, thank you very much for that. So, no so yeah, thanks thank for, for coming in. And uh, we have uh, seven minutes or so left. And what, uh, what we'd like to do is, uh, is take a few more questions I'll send to the panelists and, uh, uh, and then uh, start to close. Uh, Want to make sure we talk again about next steps because no one wants to be part of a one-off event, and uh, this is not meant to be uh, uh, anything but the beginning of a conversation that will continue to shape the space inside and and outside uh, of the gallery. So we've got uh, someone here asking about. Well, there's uh, timely. How do we continue this conversation? 
and can, to continue to uh, engage artists and develop uh, concrete actions and next steps. So and with concrete timelines, people are asking for as well. So maybe that's uh, that's one that I uh, uh, I might refer to Alex. Uh, it might get us into some of the closing comments as well. Uh, so Alexandra Bazza, who is the um, uh, who is the CEO of the of the gallery? If you want to speak a bit about the next steps uh, to this conversation, hello, Alex. Hi. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I think uh, we have been listening with very, very open ears uh, about all of this, uh, and and it's really actually in line with our own thinking. This real sort of fundamental shifting, uh, some paradigm shifts uh, that we want to see at at an institutional level. Uh, you know, I think OEG is, is primed uh, for that right now. So uh, really concrete next steps is, is we do want to have a, a more in-depth conversation uh, with artists within our communities so we can start actually uh, plotting uh, some of this out. Um, we were thinking, um, I have a little announcement when we're going to be opening soon, but I'll say that to the very end. Um, but we'd love to be able to do that, uh, you know, in, in front of each other as opposed to Zoom, but we might have to go in that direction. So we want to do that right away. And then the idea of hiring a curator and doing an exhibition absolutely uh, was in our thoughts uh, to move on quite quickly. Um, so I would say that those are two things we want to move in right away. And then when you talk about those in institutional shifts, I mean, that's why uh, we're, we're, we're bringing this conversation uh, as part of our strategic planning process, because that we define where we're going in the next little while. And so if that kind of shifting uh, and breaking down of, of old methods, old practices uh, uh, are, are going to happen, they have to happen at that institution, that core institutional level, at, at a governance level, uh, at a leadership level. Um, so. So absolutely, like all of this is going to be uh, brought in into mm -hmm. thinking of those strategic priorities, like I said, in the short term, but I think we're very much interested in, you know, how we're doing the building blocks uh, for the longer term. Okay, thank and, you. And very briefly, if you would, if you'd permit me, uh, we are going to establish an anti-racism secretariat. There will be a public consultation. People need to remember that the city has a tremendously large uh, art collection that it actually has other museums uh, other cultural spaces that it's in charge of and that we want to see uh, equal uh, uh, you know representation and, and uh, equity of opportunities there so I would also uh, encourage people to get involved once we get into public consultation uh, not just to focus on the typical areas that you would think governance uh, employment uh, at the city economic development also arts and culture should be center stage there as well in terms of the conversations that we have. Yes, and arts and culture was what we turned to when the pandemic first yep. happened. I like to remind people that because they go, well, arts, you know, and I'm going, where did we go when we were feeling mm -hmm. most vulnerable? And where do we go as Black people when we're feeling more vulnerable? It is all the ways in which we express through art. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's particularly important. So you'll be, you'll be pleased to see some things roll out pretty quickly because they were in the works. <laughs> and so there'll be, it'll, it, it's not opportunistic, it was started and so it'll, it'll happen, but we need to do a lot more and, uh, and not just in the walls, but outside and support people tangibly. Uh, there. And uh, so we're coming to the end of this conversation. And I'm going to suggest that one of the items that I saw uh, in the feed that we keep for a future conversation, and that is what's in the way of art black artists being represented? And, and what about the mindset? And what about allies and how they need to act, et cetera? And that's a huge other conversation, which we will invite you to come back to at one of the either in-person or online events, because that's, that's a whole, that's a lot of unpacking. Yeah. <laughs> and people said, well, white privilege and white fragility and power and all this. Absolutely, that needs some unpacking and uh, happy to, uh, to continue to do that. I think people are coming out of their initial uh, uh, trauma from the George Floyd uh, lynching and moving to what can we do differently to change this this pond in which we all uh, we all swim 
and uh, and make it a better place where where we can all be respected and supported. So Alex, you have a big announcement. You have less than a minute uh, to uh, make that announcement. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Cozy. Thank you, Councillor King and Dominique. Thank you so much uh, for leading this conversation, this truly important conversation. Uh, it, you know, so many great things uh, that, that we will take forward. Um, my big uh, announcement, uh, which I think that people will be hopefully really excited to hear, is that we have a date to when we're going to open our doors again. Uh, so, hooray, that'll be July 8th. Um, first of all, for frontline workers uh, and, and healthcare workers, but then July 9th uh, to, to all of us, or the rest of us. So I really do hope uh, to see you all back. I can't wait to, to welcome you through the doors. And again, I really do want to thank everybody for their honesty uh, on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery's board and, and staff uh, and, uh, and all of our volunteers, our funders. Uh, this is an incredibly important conversation, but it is just the beginning. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.